someone called this evening to say he'd been reading the Bhagavad Gita. And he said he finally understood the principle of not being attached to the, the outcome of your actions. And I had to tell him, no. There's one way in which you don't want to be attached, but there's another way you have to be very much attached. After all, you have to realize that not all religions teach the same thing. The principle of not being attached to the results of your actions makes sense only in this way, that we tend to be attached in the way that you like to do certain things and you want those things to come out well, regardless of whether they really are skillful or not. That kind of thing you can't be attached to. That kind of attachment is unhealthy, because it gets in the way of your learning anything. You do have to have, a, have to be attached to the idea that you want to do things in a way that gives rise to skillful results. You've got to hold on to that. That's the raft that takes you across the river. And although ultimately you may get past needing the raft when you get to the other side of the river, as long as you're crossing over, you have to hold on. You want to learn from your mistakes. You want to take your actions very seriously, and the results of your actions, you have to take those very seriously too. Not to the point where you get depressed or discouraged, but you want to encourage yourself to keep on trying to do things in a skillful way, and you find yourself doing things in a way that's not unskillful. You want to figure it out. What went wrong? Was it the intention? Was it the way you try to implement the intention? You've got to learn to read your actions from the beginning point, from when you first have the intention to act, and then while you're doing the action, and then after it's done. And these are the instructions the Buddha gave to Rahula. And they underlie everything else he taught. As we noted today, it carries all the way through the practice of meditation when the Buddha teaches about emptiness. It's essentially an application of the same principle. You meditate and you want to, one, figure out how do you do it well? How do you get the mind really to settle down? And then how do you see clearly where there's a disturbance, even in that state of concentration? And you notice the areas where it's empty of the disturbance. That's what the emptiness means. And where there still is a disturbance. You do this by comparing it to where it was before. So there it is, comparing mind. But it's important. The analogy the Buddha gives is when you leave a village and go into the wilderness, and you realize that all the disturbances you had, being in the village, having to worry about the politics, worrying about this person's attitude and that person's attitude, when you finally get out in the wilderness, you can put that aside. So there's this emptiness there, an emptiness of disturbance. It's a very positive sense of emptiness. What disturbance is left? You've got the perception of wilderness now. And it's not totally a pleasant thing, because there are dangers in the wilderness. There are animals out there. There are diseases out there. You're far away from any doctor. Back in the days before, people were so thoroughly protected from the wilderness, the wilderness was a scary thing. They called it the howling wilderness. So there are the dangers of being in the wilderness. So you get past those by bringing the mind to concentration. The mind is totally with, say, the breath or any of the formless states. You can drop the concerns of being in the wilderness when you're there. It's just you and the breath. Or as the Buddha recommends in that particular sutta, you hold on to the perception of earth. Everything solid has earth. The trees are earth. The earth is earth. The animals are earth. Your body is earth. It's all just earth.
And when you hold that perception in mind, then the disturbances of being afraid of being in the wilderness or the dangers that they come to you physically, those get dropped. It's just earth with earth. And then he says, and you stretch that perception of earth out in all directions. You're not paying any attention to the, the rise and the fall, the, the ridges and the hollows. He says it's like taking an animal skin and stretching it out with a hundred pegs. So it's totally flat, no more wrinkles. But you can hold earth in mind that way. And you can settle in and, as he says, enjoy, indulge that perception. And you can carry the soups through many subtle states of meditation, the infinitude of space, the infinitude of consciousness, nothingness, neither perception nor non-perception. In each state it's the same thing. You settle in, you indulge in it, and then you see where is there a disturbance still there. And you always find the disturbances with the perception. It's something you're doing. And ironically, the thing you're doing to create that state is also the disturbance. So you let go, let go. And essentially you're doing the same thing that the Buddha taught Rahul in the very beginning. You're looking at these things as actions, and you're seeing where there's still any harm. Harm here, though, gets very subtle, so it's just that level of disturbance. The importance of this is when you get to these very subtle states, you don't start regarding them as the ground of being. This is particularly likely when you hit the infinitude of consciousness. You say, wow, this must be it. Everything just arises from here and passes away, and this consciousness, this awareness is, spreads everywhere and it's not touched by anything. Everything comes out of this consciousness and returns to it. And if you forget that this too is an action, this state you've got is something you've created, then it's easy to come to all sorts of false conclusions about it. But you've got to keep this perception in mind. This is an action. You carry this all the way through and practice. What you're doing, though, is simply raising your standard for what's skillful and what's not. This is one of the gifts that the Buddha gives us. He keeps raising our standards. It goes together with another gift. I was thinking about this the other day. One of the gifts that Ajahn Fuang gave to me was that in doing the practice it wasn't to please him. As a child I had always been very attuned to trying to please my parents. Went to school, tried to please my teachers, lived my whole life trying to please people. And in one way it got me very, very well socialized, but in another way it has its dangers, because if you decide that you don't care for a particular person anymore, you don't care whether you please them. So it's not a very reliable standard for motivating people to do what's right. So when I first went to stay with John Fung, I admired him a lot, so I wanted to please him. And I began to find pretty quickly that whatever I did, it was never good enough, which was frustrating. And I had the typical reactions, well, if he did, it's not good enough for him, well, maybe he's just being too picky or whatever. But eventually I had to come back to the principle that, wait a minute, I'm doing this to please myself. I'm suffering and I need to get rid of my own suffering. And it's not for anybody else. As he would often say, we're not anybody's servants. Nobody paid us to be ordained. Nobody's paying us to practice. We're here, <clears throat> we're here because our suffering is pushing us into the practice, and we want to put an end to it. Now the danger, of course, if you're here just to please yourself is that you turn into a sociopath. So that's the second gift that you get from the teacher, which I got from John Fu, which was to raise my standards for how to please myself, what counted as making myself happy enough. And part of it was realizing that 
There's a lot of suffering that goes on, even in the mind, that seems to be very still. And you can't forget about other people, but your concern doesn't have to be about simply pleasing them or whether they like you. Your main concern has to be, is, are your actions causing them any suffering? And you have to make sure that your happiness does not depend on the suffering of others. And on a more, more positive note, is there any way you can help them? Can that be part of your practice, too? Can you learn how to overcome your stinginess and your narrowness and your other antisocial defilements by going out of your way to be genuinely helpful to other people? Again, not to make them like you, but because you see they have something lacking and you can help them learn how to overcome that lack. And you're not doing it to make points, you're not doing it to advertise your kindness, simply it's part of your practice. You need to help other people sometimes to broaden your, broaden your perspective. It's good for you, as in that analogy the Buddha gives with the, the acrobats. When you're kind to others, you're helping yourself. When you look after yourself, making sure that you're mindful, alert, careful in your actions, scrupulous in your actions, you're benefiting, the people around you benefit as well. Whereas in the story of King Basenadi and his queen, one night where he's in the mood he turns to her and says, is there anyone you love more than yourself? And of course, he's expecting that she'll say, yes, it's Your Majesty, you. But this is Queen Malika. She was no fool. She said, no, there's nobody I love more than myself. How about you? Anybody you love more than yourself? End of scene. King goes down and reports to the Buddha what they said. And the Buddha says, that's true. You survey the whole world. You never find anyone that you love more than yourself. In the same way, everybody else loves themselves fiercely. So the conclusion is not that you have to fight off everybody else. The conclusion is you want to make sure that you never harm anyone else. And you can read this two ways. One is that you realize that if your happiness depends on their suffering, they're going to do what they can to put an end to your suffering, so you've got to be careful not to step on their toes. Another level, though, you can realize that there's this empathetic reaction. You realize that you really want happiness, and you look at other people and they really want happiness, too. And there's an empathy and a sympathy that goes with that. One level where we can all resonate, one level where we can all connect. Now, fortunately, there is a way to find happiness that doesn't cause harm to anyone else. It's through training the mind. But essentially, your, your motivation remains the same. You're looking for happiness. And there's that question the Buddha said it's the beginning of wisdom. What when I do it will be for my long-term welfare and happiness. Notice the my. But also notice the I. It's something I have to do. And as you work for happiness, it's really long-term. You, you inevitably find that it has to be a happiness that doesn't harm anybody else. Partly because it just doesn't feel right harming other people, and secondly because on a purely pragmatic basis, long-term happiness can last only if it's not harming anyone else. And so that sort of blurs the distinction between your happiness and other people's happiness. But again, you're not doing this to please anybody. You're doing it to please yourself. So those are the two gifts you get from a teacher. One is realizing that you don't have to please the teacher. You're here to please yourself. But the teacher also teaches you've got to raise your standards for what's pleasing. So it does involve helping other people.
that your quest for happiness really does produce what you want, which is an ultimate happiness, a true happiness, a happiness that doesn't change, a happiness where your mind is safe. In other words, you're not exposed to the danger of being tempted to do any evil ever again. The reason people do evil is because their happiness depends on things that change and they're afraid that things will change and so they fight off any possible change. Of course, that effort is doomed, but in the meantime they can cause a lot of trouble. And although we like to think that we're by nature good people, if your food source gets threatened, i.e. your source of happiness gets threatened, the fangs can come out. That's a scary thought. So you are here to please yourself, but you want to make sure that your standards for pleasing yourself stay high.